This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. We all strive to live a long, prosperous, and healthy life. With advances in health and medical sciences, this goal is ever more attainable. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is a nonprofit organized research unit under the auspices of the University of California at San Diego, committed to advancing lifelong health and independence through research, education, and patient care. To better empower and improve the lives of young and old alike, the Stein Institute presents the following program. Basically, when we see a, a patient, and, and really anybody, any primary care physician or whoever that is assessing a patient, um, needs to ask the patient some of the questions about family history of cancer, and it's kind of a baseline thing in a history and physical. For breast cancer, it's un important to understand the genetics, because a lot of patients think that if they don't have a family history, they don't have risk for breast cancer, and, and that's not really true. But if you do have a family history, knowing the genetics and how they interplay with that is very important. Five to 10% of breast and ovarian cancers are, are a result of what's called the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutation. If you have family members that were really young when they had their breast cancer, or you yourself are really young with your breast cancer, then you have a higher risk of having that gene. If you are Ashkenazi Jewish, there is a 2% risk just off the bat that you carry the gene for breast cancer. And if there's a family history together with that, there's up to a 50% risk that you carry a mutation. So the risk of carrying the mutation is the highest if the first of your relatives or yourself are pretty young when the breast cancer developed. There are a lot of other genes out there that can result in breast cancer, and there's just a few that are listed here. The P53 mutation, Lee from any syndrome, Cowden syndrome. Some of these are associated with sarcomas, leukemias, and things like that. So what we do when we see a patient that we see clustering of cancer, we actually refer them to a genetic counselor who goes through all of the details and what various mutations might exist and goes through with the patient um, what they should be tested for. If, if somebody carries the gene for breast cancer, they have an up to 85% risk of getting breast cancer and up to 40% risk of getting ovarian cancer. Um, once there's already been one cancer and we, de we detect the gene, we don't know exactly what the risk is of getting a second, but it's probably about 5% per year. There's a lot of people who have family history who don't carry a gene, and that's probably you know, the greater number of people. And it may be that there are a lot of genes out there that we haven't isolated yet. It may be that there are some familial issues that are not so much genetic, uh, but we do see this, where somebody has three sisters of breast cancer and we test everybody and there's no BRCA gene. So, beside from having a family history, what are some of the other risk factors of breast cancer? Well, just being an aging female is the biggest risk. By 60 years old, a woman is already age appropriate enough to consider taking agents to prevent breast cancer. So just being over 60 puts someone at, at, at an elevated risk. Family history, like I stated, age of the first birth or never having baby, so age over 30 of having, having a baby. Race, Caucasian women are actually at the highest risk. History of having any abnormal breast biopsy. So on a scale of like one to 10, where 10 is cancer, having something atypical is down around three or four or so. So that's already a risk factor. And believe it or not, how many benign breast biopsies a woman has had. It often will scare me more to see a young woman who's had many benign fibroadenomas removed than actually having a family history because those fibroadenomas are a proliferative problem and that is an elevated risk for breast cancer. The age of her first period, less than 12. Obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer. Body fat content above and beyond where it was when a woman graduated high school is a risk factor and then smoking is a risk factor. 
What do we do with all of these risks? Well, we actually have a lot of different uh, statistical models to, to predict a woman's risk, and one of them is called the Gale model. And anything over 1.66% in five years is considered risk, and that, that equates to somewhere around 20% in lifetime. The Gale model does underscore things like paternal history, secondary degree relatives, and things like that, but we don't want to overestimate risk, and so I think the Gale model is a good baseline for primary cares and everything, everybody to, to use to determine if women are at risk or not. So how do we use risk assessment? Well, it's actually getting very elaborate now. There's something called the Athena Network that UC San Diego is part of. Is part of. It's the five UC campuses that have gotten together over the last few years and have developed a huge collaborative network of research and patient care. And one of the big issues with the Athena Network is finding out who's at risk and trying to be more widespread with determining risk. And one of the things that we sometimes offer a very high-risk high woman is better screening with something like MRI, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There are also, like I said, other things um, that, can, that can deliberately lead to high risk, and one of them is a high-risk pathology, and I mentioned atypia. If a woman has a diagnosis of atypical ductal hyperplasia, bi biopsied from like a mammogram or something, she actually has a fourfold increased risk of breast cancer. If she then couples that with a family history, it can go up to a 15-fold risk. So it's very important to uh, remember um, if you've had anything atypical removed from your breast to talk to your doctor about prevention. Lobular carcinoma in situ is another word we use. It's a, it's not, we don't use the word pre-malignant with LCIS, but it's a marker for the potential for malignancy, 20 to 30% risk that breast cancer can develop. Both these groups, prevention discussion, extremely important. There are lifestyle risk factors, weight management, exercise, alcohol consumption, smoking, and HRT. There was a big study called the Nurses' Health Study and another study called the California Teachers' Study. They were both large cohorts of women that were followed for many, many years to look at different risk factors for breast cancer. The, the Nurses' Health Initiative Study uh, was initiated in 1976. There were over 121,000 women who were mailed questionnaires and then were given follow-up every two years. Since that time, as we've developed other risk factors, things like diet have been added to the questionnaire. The conclusions of some of these studies are that, uh, that uh, body mass index, basically, increased body fat and body mass index increases the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer significantly. Um, and it's, it's not only just increase in weight, but it's an increase in rate relative to where you were when you were about 18. So really a woman should try to stay about where she was when she graduated high school. There seems to be a more pronounced risk in the, in the high body mass index women who also take HRT. Exercise. I don't think that this is stated nearly enough, basically. There are multiple, multiple studies going all the way back to 1994 um, in the journal of the national uh, the journal of the NCI that reinforced that that regular exercise decreases risk of breast cancer De decreases not only getting it but the risk of death from breast cancer the exact amount of exercise we don't know um, I think it's probably truthfully um, rigorous exercise an hour a day five days a week I think that's what I tell my patients so it's a little bit different than heart healthy exercise which is more like 20 minutes a day smoking um, the duration of smoking and actually smoking um, increases risk of breast cancer heavy um, use so greater than uh, 25 cigarettes a day is linked with breast cancer and those who started young before the age of 17 so women who smoke for more than 20 years have a risk um, and for, for women who um, started before their first baby, uh, there's an increased risk of up to 18%. So I think just like we know with smoking and other diseases, smoking adds to breast cancer risk. And then alcohol, now, you know, I really have, have kind of scrutinized these studies because this is a difficult one to, to tell patients because we hear from the heart healthy studies that alcohol can be um, protective for women and we do need to remember that 500,000 women year, a, a year die of heart disease. Um, but alcohol, too much alcohol can have a negative effect on, on a woman's breast cancer risk. Um, overall, where we are with the, with the data is that probably more than four alcoholic drinks per week um, starts to elevate a, a patient's risk. And I think what, what may be happening with the alcohol content is, again, it, it may in some way be promoting estrogen product, production above and beyond normal for a woman, increasing her breast density and things like that, and leading to increased risk. 
Diet, unfortunately, has been a little bit more skeptical. Um, we ran the WELL study here at UCSD, which was an intervention diet of uh, a normal heart-healthy diet versus a diet very, very, very high in fruits and vegetables. And that did not show a statistical difference in survival from breast cancer. Uh, there is a little bit of early data that a diet very, very lo low in fat may prevent some of the more higher risk breast cancers, but unfortunately, we haven't really been able to make a clear cut link with diet and breast cancer at this time. HRT and breast cancer risk, um, and this came out you know, a number of years ago now, um, that the combination of estrogen and progesterone together increased a woman's breast cancer risk by 26%, eight more women per 10,000 taking HRT developed breast cancer, seven more developed heart attacks, eight more developed strokes, and 18 more developed pulmonary embolism, thromboembolism, things like that. There was a reduction in colon cancer and a reduction in hip fracture, and there were no mortality differences. The recent update of that um, actually looked at estrogen, or estrogen alone, because we thought for a while that estrogen alone may not increase risk, but it seems that estrogen replacement alone over a great many years may slightly elevate uh, breast cancer risk as well. And it kind of makes sense because the estrogen or pro progesterone are growth promoters. And again, what happens in cancer is abnormal growth and anything that's promoting growth could pr potentially promote cancer. So, so what about screening with all that? So we, have, we know, you know that people have risk factors and we have them in our clinics and you're out there and it's like, okay, so what, what about screening? How does that fit into this? Because a lot has been stated about screening in the last couple of years. There are three types of screening that we talk about, breast self-examination, clinical breast exam, and annual mammogram. Unfortunately, breast self-examination taught worldwide and a lot of public health dollars going into teaching it has never proven to save any lives from breast cancer. And there's actually a little bit of data that biopsy rate goes up when women do chronic breast self-examination uh, and there's, there's more te technical things done to those women, et cetera. So unfortunately, breast self-examination doesn't seem to in increase survival from breast cancer. That being said, I think there's still a happy medium that a woman should know her breasts, she should know what's new and what's not new, um, but actually going out and teaching pe people breast self-exam does not seem to, to make a, a survival difference. Screening mammography. So we all heard from the American Task Force guidelines a couple of years ago that maybe we don't need to be screening women for breast cancer with mammography between 40 and 50, and maybe we don't need to be doing it every year. Basically, what mammogram does is look for the difference between the color of a cancer against the color of the density of the breast. So sometimes what mammogram is seeing is something that is not necessarily that aggressive, and because of that, when we pick it up, may not, it may not need to be as fast as we think we do. So going to every two years may not affect survival. And what the task force said was that between the ages of 40 and 50, for every 1,900 women that we screen for 10 years, so it was basically 19,000 screens, one life would be saved. Whereas if you started after 50, it would be 1,500, or one out of 1,500. So th they thought that the risk of getting unnecessary biopsies and of alarming women did not, was not a benefit enough to screen women between 40 and 50. So when this came out, you know, it created a lot of controversy and I've looked at this, looked at this you know, from both sides now for two years. And I think the good thing that came out of this was that what we're realizing, it's not always about early detection with breast cancer. It is much about the biology. If you have a low grade breast cancer, there may be a day that we don't treat that at all. And so certainly rushing in to get a mammogram may not be necessary at all and is probably not gonna make a difference in survival between one year and the next. So the, the recommendations of the American Cancer Society and the American College of Radiology and the American College of Surgeons and et cetera was to continue screening women between 40 and 50 for a number of reasons. One, because even if one life is saved out of 1900, that's a very valuable age group. Those are women that have young children and, and even one life is, is to many, you know, a very, a very necessary life that we need to save. But besides from the social impact, I think there were issues with the study where we didn't include some of, like I say, the atypical patients, the, early, the stage zeros and things like that, that could change what we do for prevention. So it is still the general recommendations to get a mammogram every year after 40 in this country. 
Uh, other studies that went on to kind of examine this a little bit better showed that, like in the ne Netherlands, they looked at a group of women and they actually found that there was an increased survival in their group from 40 to 49 percent, or 40 to 49 age group. And they also found that women who, uh, who did get screening mammography regularly had less aggressive surgery. So if you waited longer to get screening mammography, you were more apt to have a mastectomy than have just a lumpectomy. They also found during this time that women who were treated in a breast center actually had better survival. And so maybe you could forego doing mammograms as often if they were getting really good follow-up uh, or get good attention in a breast center. So you can see that this created a lot, of, a lot of confusion for people on, well, what should I do with my mammogram? So again stated, I think most of us still think um, after age 40 every year, but women should know it may cause an unnecessary biopsy if you, if you have a mammogram in that age group. Um, what else do we do for screening? Um, one of the imaging studies, like I talked about, is breast MR. Um, and breast MR basically uses the injection of an imaging agent called gadolinium. And gadolinium is taken up differently by cancer cells than by, than by benign cells. So you're no longer looking at the difference of the color of a cancer versus the color of the breast. You're now taking up an agent th by the cancer cell that's different than a benign cell. So MRI is an addition to mammogram for high-risk screening, basically, or for diagnostics. So the current indications are a lymph node metastasis where we don't know where it came from, very high-risk women greater than a 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, someone who has uh, a symptom in their breast but their mammogram is very, very dense. Dense breasts are also a risk factor for breast cancer or for problems, um, problems select in selected patients where we're trying to solve how to, how to treat that patient. Uh, the benefits of an MRI is that um, it does not use ionizing radiation. It has a good sensitivity for invasive breast cancer, and like I said, it's an injection of an, of an imaging agent. The limitations of an MRI are that it sees things that aren't cancer, called a false positive, more often, and that's stressful and that's costly. MRIs can also themselves be very expensive, depending on where you get it. It can range from $800 all the way up to $5,000. There's no real standards in MRI still, so the way they're read are different from institution to institution. And then biopsying once you see something on an MRI can be difficult. So you can see that there need to be really clear indications for, for, this, for this very elaborate test. So MRI, the way I use it is in the correct patient is very, very helpful to me. Um, a cancer found by MRI with a negative mammogram, um, this is a, an example of a patient with a very, very dense breast pattern. She was very high risk, and so she met the criteria for MRI, um, and this is an MRI where you can see the little circled thing. It's, it's a fairly significant cancer. It's a couple centimeter cancer that was not seen at all in mammogram. So for the very high risk woman where we're worried that mammogram isn't going to be sufficient for her, an MRI is a good choice. I also use MRI to help me decide how much surgery to do, and I, I always use this kind of classic example. This woman came in with one one centimeter tumor on her mammogram and ultrasound, but very dense breasts. I wasn't sure that mammogram was seeing the whole scope of things, ordered an MRI, and she had this grapevine of tumors going up the entire lateral aspect of her breast, and we were actually able to, to plan the correct surgery for her. We, we took the whole massive tumor out via a breast reduction, basically. She got a very nice cosmetic result and clear margins. And what would have happened before MR is we would have gotten a positive margin, we would have gone back, another positive margin, we would have gone back. She would have had three surgeries with positive margins until we figured out that there's too much there. MRI can be very useful for the high-risk patient. All BRCA patients, because of their 85% risk, should have an MRI yearly. Atypical ductal hyperplasia patients should have it on diagnosis and then a consideration of follow-up MRI in the future. The same with lobular carcinoma in situ. Patients with two first-degree young relatives should at least have a baseline MRI and then depending on their breast density should consider it yearly. And then patients with a strong family history of breast cancer who also have implants because implants, um, they, they um, minimize how much breast tissue you can see. So if there's a lot of risk, then an MRI should be considered. If, if a patient does not have other elevated risk, then an MRI is not necessary just with implants. This is an example of diffuse enhancement surrounding an implant. There was nothing at all seen on her mammogram, and she had 17 centimeters of high-grade stage zero breast cancer. 
Um, also, I, I bring, I always kind of slide this slide in before I talk a little bit, a bit more about MRI. Cosmetic implant issues, uh, it, it, you, whenever we're addressing a cosmetic implant issue, we always want to image them first, um, and there are issues that I will then follow up with MRI. A patient who has capsular contracture like this woman has, she has saline implants under her breast causing contracture, causing compression. Um, she you know, came to us for correction um, and I ended up MRIing her because of some family history and finding, you know, finding a little abnormality that we were able to take out um, and then replacing her implants under the muscle and doing a breast lift. So um, I kind of used the imaging along with my cosmetic decisions for her. Um, this is a patient who came to me again for a cosmetic breast implant issue, had a couple little tiny calcifications on her breast, turned out they were ductal carcinoma in situ, um, wasn't sure that was all I was seeing, and then MRI shows you know, a big rim of, of ductal carcinoma in situ around the implant. What else do we use for diagnostic tests? Um, well, I, I could go on and on about you know, the type of tests there are. There's another test called breast-specific gamma Im imaging. There is PET mammogram. There's all kinds of different tests of the breast. Um, I just put one more in here that I do use for nipple discharge, and this is called ductoscopy. Ductoscopy is actually a tiny little scope, 0.9 millimeter, that goes into the breast. And I use this for people with nipple discharge, basically. This is what the inside of a normal breast looks like. It actually looks like a colonoscopy. It's a little duct, you know, just normal little duct. You can put the scope all the way down and you can take a look at it. And then this next picture is what is called an intraductal papilloma, which is a high risk lesion basically that can be associated with breast cancer. You can see the little flowery thing inside the duct and the duct is blue because right beforehand I, I sent her to mammography to see if they could see it and we injected it with blue dye. But what's nice about these is it really defines the anatomy. You can see where we're going that we can actually see the, the anatomy, the ducts of the, of the breast and eventually we may be able to use this technology to actually intervene and prevent breast cancer with certain drugs. So what can we do for prevention, basically? There are two types of prevention. One is called chemo prevention, and then the other is surgical prevention. Chemo prevention basically means giving drugs, and chemo prevention was based on two large trials, basically. The first one is called the P1 trial, and it was uh, the brainchild of the NSABP, which is the National Surgical Adjunct Breast and Bowel Project, and they have been around since the 60s conducting breast cancer trials. And then the follow-up trial to that was the STAR trial. The P1 trial was done in the 90s and basically looked at 13,000 high-risk women and you were defined as high-risk if you were greater than 60, if you had lobular carcinoma in situ, or if you met the Gale model of more than 1.66% in five years. Tamoxifen is a drug, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It, it basically changes the way the various organs in the body respond to estrogen. And in the breast, it downregulates the breast. Actually, in the bones, it upregulates. It actually helps for osteoporosis. And the bad thing about tamoxifen is it actually stimulates the blood vessels and can slightly lead to increased risk of clotting like PEs and things. So tamoxifen is a drug that's been around in breast cancer for years. And we knew, based on old studies, that we used to see less breast cancer in the opposite breast when we used it. So this, study, this drug was chosen for the prevention study, and it was a placebo-controlled because we'd never, we never knew whether or not there was a drug that could prevent breast cancer. At the end of the trial, there was a 49% reduction across the board in the, devel the development of breast cancer. And what was really striking, I, I've talked to you about that high-risk group, that people, the people with atypia, the people who were kind of down the scale like three or four, there was actually an 86% reduction in their breast cancer. So that's where we really want to find people. So that woman between 40 and 50 on, who on her mammogram has abnormal calcifications that turn out to be atypia, if I can intervene then with tamoxifen and, and give her an 86% risk reduction, then I've really affected her health care. The reduction was in estrogen receptor positive patients, which makes sense because it's blocking the way the estrogen functions in the breast. There were complications, like I say, stroke, DVT, and in women over 50, it stimulates the uterus and so a slight increased risk of uterine cancer. 
and there was no survival benefit ever established, and that's where the trial was criticized by, out, by investigators outside of the United States because it was not powered to go to survival. It was, it was just powered to look at breast cancer inc incidents. Because of the risk of tamoxifen, there was a second trial that was then opened, and this was called the Moore, or this was called Reloxifene, the STAR trial, and it was based on something called the Moore trial, where Reloxifene was developed for osteoporosis. And they discovered along the way, while they were doing the trials for osteoporosis, there, there was much less breast cancer in the women treated with this drug. And then they realized, well, it's very similar to tamoxifen, it just has a little bit different carbon side chain to it. Um, same risk factors for the, for the PEs and the DVTs, but absolutely no uterine cancer. So basically the NSABP said, well, if we can get rid of the uterine cancer risk, let's see if it works as well for breast cancer in a head-to-head -head trial. And so the P2 trial actually compared tamoxifen to raloxifene. There was now no placebo, because we know now that we had something for prevention. Uh, again, the same risk factors, but this time only postmenopausal women were included because that's the only time we had ever basically used that drug. The study found equally uh, intense risk reduction for invasive breast cancers. So they were equally as good for the reduction of invasive breast cancers. What we didn't see with raloxifene was a decrease in stage zero breast cancer. Um, and so that, you know, that's always made a few of us question, you know, why that is. But, but in this trial, there was, there was no uterine cancer risk and the other risk factors were very similar. So because there was no uterine cancer risk, the FDA pretty quickly approved raloxifene for postmenopausal women for, for risk reduction. So if you're high risk today for premenopausal women, tamoxifen is your choice. For postmenopausal women, raloxifene is your choice. So we now have two drugs and I'll talk about a third one in just a second. The other thing that we can do for prevention is actually shut down the ovaries. So uh, the data actually shows that there may be up to an 80% reduction in risk for women who carry the gene for breast cancer if they either just take out their ovaries or shut them down. Um, and so the way we shut them down is with what's called a gonad gonadotrophin releasing hormone inhibitor called Zolodex. There's also some very interesting results with the diabetes drug that metformin may reduce breast cancer risk, osteoporosis agents like Fosamex, and then, like I said before, a diet very, very high or low in fat may reduce certain breast cancers. And what metformin seems to do is inhibit the growth of the breast epithelial cells. Um, when, when given to mice, there was a 30 to 50% reduction in the size of the tumor. And then finally, there was recently um, the data uh, came coming out about an, one more drug called exemestane. The, like I said, the group of drugs, tamoxifen and raloxifene, those are estrogen receptor modulators. There's a whole nother group that we use in cancer called aromatase inhibitors. They block a woman from making estrogen from her fat stores. So our fat stores are our own little manufacturers of estrogen. The aromatase inhibitors inhibit those. And this study, again, took the same high-risk population um, and found that there was a significant decrease uh, in breast cancer development um, down by 65% or so, and so it was statistically significant over placebo. The trouble with these drugs, they have no horrible risks, they don't, they don't cause DVTs and they don't cause cancer, but this class of drugs, because it blocks every bit of estrogen a woman is making, can lead to osteoporosis, osteopenia, joint pain, hair loss, things, like, things that, that are very nagging and annoying for women. So it's a little bit harder for me to suggest this group of drugs because I, I don't want to affect a woman's day-to-day -day functioning. You know? But it is, it, for someone who's very, very high risk, it is something to consider. And then finally, surgical prevention, because we talked all about chemo prevention. The bottom line is surgical prevention does prevent breast cancer by, by between 90 and 98 percent. That's about as much breast as you can remove. There's always going to be a few cells left behind. The breast goes all the way up to the clavicle, all the way over to the, to, to the back here, all the way down to the fold, and all the way over to the sternum. So there's a lot more than just what you see in a breast. And the, the real data from, from prevention goes all the way back to a Mayo Clinic study. And basically what they did is they did a retrospective study where they looked at two groups of women. They looked at very high-risk women um, and then they looked at moderate, moderate risk women. And the high risk women, they compared to their sisters and mothers that didn't get mastectomies. And the moderate risk, they compared to what the Gale model would have predicted they would get from breast cancer. Of the high risk women, 
um, there was an 89.5% reduction in the group that had mastectomies compared to the, um, to, compared to the, the control group. Um, and then in the moderate risk, there was a greater than 90% risk reduction in the sisters and whatnot group. So overall, there was a over 90% risk reduction for bilateral mastectomy. So everybody was very excited about that. Until recently, when the JAMA came out, and we all kind of suspected this, in, in 2010, JAMA came out and looked at survival from bilateral mastectomy. So we know that we can prevent breast cancer by removing the breast, but do we actually prevent breast cancer death? And the bottom line is that in the BRCA1 and 2 patients, removing the breasts does prevent breast cancer, but does not prevent death from breast cancer. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we're either screening really well that group, and so we're catching the breast cancer so early that they're not dying of it, or that group of women, if they have their mastectomies and they're still in that 10% that get breast cancer, that breast cancer can be very virulent. So when people are making these decisions, it, it, it's beneficial to not have to go through breast cancer, not have to go through treatment, but it's also beneficial to know that are you really affecting survival. What was interesting in this study, though, is that removing the ovaries actually at a younger age, like before age 40, actually did prevent breast cancer death. And so that's very interesting. That gets back to what I said about preventing breast cancer with taking the ovaries out. Um, when we do do mastectomies, the, the whole look of a mastectomy has changed. We have the traditional mastectomy, the skin sparing, and now the nipple sparing. Um, and now, the, now things get a little bit more interesting because we get into some of our pictures. Um, this is what a traditional mastectomy looks like, and we still have to do this sometimes if we have a big breast cancer or if we have um, you know, a patient that uh, is going to need to get radiation or something like that. This is the way it may look. Um, a skin sparing mastectomy is where we take the nipple, but we leave all the skin behind. And this is a woman who had a skin sparing mastectomy and then had reconstruction from the abdominal tissue called a tram flap. And now the nipple sparing mastectomies where we're making an incision somewhere around the nipple, but we're actually not taking the nipple, we're taking all the ducts from the nipple and leaving the entire skin envelope. So we're migrating towards these women starting to look like they've just almost had a breast augmentation and not had a mastectomy. So this is what a mastectomy looks like now. This woman actually had an implant already and we did a mastectomy with it, there's no skin. And this is back such a big change from like the radical Halsteadian days when when we took you know, a big, huge skin paddle and the woman then had a skin graft. So we've really evolved. So how I do it is it, it's important uh, when doing a mastectomy to be very thorough with it. Uh, we are tending for cosmetic reasons to leave more and more tissue behind and we have to be careful with that because if we leave tissue behind then that can, cause re that can lead to recurrence. The way I do it is actually skin the nipple off the breast and actually invert the nipple. What you're looking at there is actually um, the nipple on my finger. Let's see if I can point to this here. So that's the nipple inverted and actually excise the inside of the ducts so that all of them come out and those go separately to pathology to make sure that they don't have any disease in them. And then we reconstruct with either implants or expanders. And I show this picture because um, the bottom picture is, is, is her tissue expanders right here and you can see because no skin is taken and there's all this extra skin it, it kind of moves all over the place when we first put the tissue expanders in and then when we go back to put the permanent implants we can readjust everything so we can at some point almost make them a little bit better than they started if they started with um, breasts that are droopy or, or whatnot and these are just um, some additional pictures this is the same same woman a few more months post-op um, and then because we're leaving the nipple we do have problems sometimes the nipple going a little little haywire. It'll sometimes turn to the side and things like that. So we're still kind of evolving, you know, our technique with these. And this is a BRCA patient who chose to have her breasts removed for her very high risk. And so for these particular women, our, our young BRCA patients, we really want to remove all of the tissue adequately as much as possible, but then get them back to something that's very livable for them so that they don't feel deformed. Um, and this is another young BRCA patient, same kind of situation. So we're putting, sometimes we'll do this, the incision under the, under the breast, sometimes we'll do it on top, depending on kind of their anatomy and what has to happen. And then our final, this, this patient had um, a triple negative breast cancer and because the estrogen receptor negative breast cancers, 
um, they don't provide us with a target to prevent another breast cancer. So often our young women with very high risk breast cancers will choose bilateral mastectomies because they don't have any way to prevent yet another one from coming. So. And then we also do these procedures in patients who need to get radiated. So we will leave the nipple behind now, even if someone needs to get radiated. So we're being very liberal now with leaving the nipple as long as the surgery is done properly. So I'm gonna give two examples of our decision-making in these high-risk women. The first one is a 23-year-old who tested positive for BRCA2. Her mother and grandmother had prophylactic mastectomies by some very astute surgeons years ago, 20 years ago. Her 32-year-old aunt had already died of breast cancer and her 28-year-old cousin was just diagnosed with breast cancer. So it's a difficult thing in this girl because she has young breast cancer and it's getting younger and younger and younger. So careful observation with mammogram and MRI um, may not be the best choice for her. And now we have a little bit of data on these women getting mammograms too young. There may be radiation risk. So it, it, that may not be the best thing for her because she's a ticking time bomb at this point. We're not gonna take her ovaries out at 23, 24. The earliest that we really like to do that is about 35 because of all of the other risk factors that go with removing all the hormones at that age. Tamoxifen, all the data on tamoxifen doesn't really traditionally go down that young. And so in her particular case, bilateral mastectomies made sense. And this was like over 10 years ago, and you can actually see the scars. We weren't doing nipple sparing 10 years ago, um, and the scars are much longer, and the shape is a little bit different because of it. But you know, one of the best compliments that she gave me after this was all over is, I don't think about breast cancer anymore, because she thought about it her whole life growing up. The other example is a 50-year-old who had breast cancer 10 years ago, chose lumpectomy and radiation. She then did tamoxifen and she did chemotherapy and she was recently diagnosed with BRCA and she had her ovaries out because she has ovarian cancer risk with the BRCA. So somebody told her you have to take your breasts off and she actually was upset by that and she was appropriately upset by that because she does not fit into that same category. She already reduced her risk with tamoxifen. She reduced her risk on the one side that had cancer by having the lumpectomy and radiation. She's already a little older, and so maybe it's overkill at this point to have to do something like a bilateral mastectomy is on her, and maybe we should just follow her with MRI, and so that's what she chose to do. So it is not cookie-cutter medicine. Nothing should be cookie-cutter medicine, but particularly breasts shouldn't be. There are algorithm, algorithms that we follow, but each person is an individual, and what we do is we sit down and we go over their risks, we go over their statistics, and they make decisions from there. All in all, the future in preventing all of this is gonna be manipulating the genome. I'm hoping someday that we don't have any more breast cancer. I'm a plastic surgeon and would be happy doing tummy tucks um, instead of taking care of breast cancer patients. Um, so hopefully it won't have to be as radical as it has been. All right, so moving on to the treatment of breast cancer. Um, what are some of the new avenues of management of cancer? Um, lymph node surgery is evolving, changes in radiation, changes what we call neoadjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant adjuvant therapy means giving drugs before we even operate, and then a bigger and bigger use of the biologic agents. So the first thing is lymph nodes. When I first went into practice years ago, that was the most dreaded thing that everybody talked about in breast cancer. They were like, am I gonna get a swollen arm? My grandmother had a huge arm. So in the mid-90s, the technique of sentinel node biopsy came about for breast cancer. It was something that was actually uh, worked on in melanoma many years before that and described in the lymphatic pathways many, many years before that. So basically what the sentinel node is, is the first lymph node that drains a tumor basin, and it can be any kind of tumor. And we find that sentinel node by injecting right near the tumor with two different, image, two, two different agents. One is an imaging agent, um, and currently we're using technetium sulfur colloid. Um, we completed uh, the development, the creation, the development, and the, and the large-scale clinical trials of a new imaging agent that actually is, is with the FDA right now for sentinel node detection. But currently what we're using is technetium sulfur colloid. And a picture is taken to see where that lymph node is. And then in the operating room, we use a blue dye that we inject so that we can actually see a blue lymph node. It's easier to detect. So this is the tumor here, and then the imaging agent is taken up by the sentinel node. Now currently, it doesn't mean that this is positive. It just means this is the first lymph node that drains the tumor. Then in the operating room, we inject the blue dye, and we open up, and we find the blue hot lymph node. We have a little gamma counter that we find it. Up until two years ago, 
If that lymph node was positive, we sent it right to pathology. If it was positive, we took the rest of the nodes around it, and that was about 20 lymph nodes that we took with an with a arm swelling rate of about 10%. But that only meant about 25% of women had to have all their nodes taken. That meant 75% didn't, because if you were negative, based on a lot of trials that were ran in, run in the 90s, there was no reason to take any more lymph nodes. Now, two years ago, there was a landmark study that changed basically the way surgical oncology of the breast is done, and that was called the Z11 trial. And basically what it was is that women who got their lymph node removed in the operating room were then randomized to either getting all of the nodes removed or to not getting the nodes removed and having their breast irradiated, which they would normally have anyway with a lumpectomy. When a woman gets a lumpectomy, she gets some sort of radiation. And it was first powered at 1,900 patients and it never got to 1,900 patients. It only got to 891. Everybody thought the trial would be dead and all that. But bang, six and a half years later, they actually got statistical significance and found that there was no difference in local recurrence and no difference in distant recurrence or survival in the people who had all their nodes removed versus the people that just had the regular radiation to their breast. And so at that point, basically, most of us just completely turned the corner. So for women that were having lumpectomy with radiation in the operating room, if they have a positive sentinel node, we stop taking out any more nodes. So that, that now accounts for probably 70% of women, 60 to 70% get breast conservation, meaning they get lumpectomy and radiation. And of those 25%, they would have had a node dissection and now they don't. So less and less women are now getting a node dissection. Currently, in 2012, you still get a node dissection if you clinically come in with positive nodes because there weren't anybody in that study like it. All the people in the study did not have any palpable big lymph nodes. They didn't have any lymph nodes you could see on imaging. They only had the sentinel node positive in the OR. So what are our options when, when a patient does need surgery? Breast conservation versus mastectomy, basically. And breast conservation means removing the lump of cancer and then, and with a clear margin around it, and then doing some sort of radiation to the breast. And we have known since the early 80s from the landmark trial, the NSABP-06 trial, that there's no survival benefit between doing a mastectomy and doing breast conservation. So we, we heavily advocate for breast conservation because it's much simpler for the woman. I will tell you there is a tendency for women to want mastectomy still, and so once we've gone through the statistics and the survival and the risks and the benefits and all of that, many women still will choose a mastectomy for their own personal reasons. Some of them want to avoid radiation. Some of them want to lower their risk of getting a new one as much as they can. But for, for, for the average, for the majority of women, we try to encourage breast conservation because it is a simpler form of treatment for them. The issue of radiation has changed quite a, quite a lot. Traditionally, radiation meant six weeks to the whole breast. Um, there are now other forms of radiation that are less than that, um, and the one of those is called partial breast radiation. And the scientific rationale between only radiating part of the breast versus the whole breast is that if you looked at women who got their whole breast radiated with, with breast cancer, the only thing that radiation prevented was nearby recurrences. It did not prevent what we call elsewhere failures, which were failures somewhere distant from the original breast cancer. So everybody started asking the question, then why are we radiating the whole breast if it's not preventing another breast cancer away from the lumpectomy? So, the, so that came about partial, that from there was born partial breast radiation. And what it is, is partial breast means a, a, some sort of device is inserted to the breast and it allows the patient to get their, their radiation over five days, twice a day for five days, and then the catheter is pulled out. There's still studies ongoing looking at who the best candidates are for this, but there's enough data to now show very similar recurrence rates. So it's a discussion a patient needs to have with the radiation oncologist depending on her tumor, whether or not she's the most appropriate. But it does make the, the radiation faster, and it is localizing the radiation. This is um, one of the forms of it, it's called mammocyte, it's a little balloon. And then this is what we're using more at UCSD because it's a little bit more conforming to the lumpectomy cavity. And our radiation oncologist actually puts this in in the procedure area. We, the patient does not have to go back to the operating room to put this in. It's put in on a Monday morning, pulled out on a Friday afternoon after radiation is finished. And the outcomes, you can see the little stab incisions, the cosmetics are very, very good for this. 
The other thing that's um, a little different in breast now, and this is really obvious and it's like, why didn't we have this forever? Traditionally, large-breasted women, when I was in surgical training, it's like, oh, she's large-breasted, she has to have a mastectomy because radiation is terrible for large-breasted women. Um, and it was because in order to get the whole field of radiation, or, uh, the whole breast radiated, um, the, the field of radiation was really extended beyond where it needed to be, and then the breast itself got too much radiation. Um, so what was developed was the prone breast board, basically, that kind of pulls the breast away and cones it so the radiation can be more precise and deliberate. And this is an example of kind of, uh, of, of a traditional trajectory of a woman's lying down, not in the prone breast board, you can see that the tangents are actually getting her vital organs and the tangents are still not getting all of the breast. So if I kind of point here, you can see the tangents are including all the way this deep, but they're still leaving all this breast behind. And if they're gonna get this, if they're gonna try to get all of that, they're gonna reach all the way over to the opposite side. So, and because of that, the woman's more at high risk for you know, various you know, lung and heart damage and for burning, over burning her breast. This is an example of the prone breast board. You can see the tangents are just getting the breast, and they're not getting anything else. Um, and so it works very efficiently for the patient. And we have seen now, since we've been using this, um, a much softer, subtler breast in our larger breasted patients. Okay, so that's kind of what's a little bit what's new in radiation, and I have to apologize because I'm not a radiation oncologist and, and there's way more that's new, but that's just a little bit of the updates. What, what about neoadjuvant therapy? So neoadjuvant therapy means giving therapy to patients before they go to the OR. So the first instinct when a patient has a breast cancer is cut it out, you know, I want it gone. That may not always be the best way to treat a patient uh, because it might be a large tumor and that might mean a mastectomy or it might be locally advanced and there, we, we might wanna treat it systemically first. So there were basically two large trials that looked at doing chemo first to see if it was safe. And again, we get back to the NSABP group. And they looked at giving chemo first and surgery versus surgery first and chemo. And what they found was that there was a real significant amount of women who were able to go from mastectomy to lumpectomy because the tumor shrunk so much. There was no survival difference if you waited on surgery and gave the chemo first, and it also gave a really nice prognostic window to the tumor. How was the tumor responding, basically? The bottom line is, if you could watch that tumor, the patients that had a complete pathologic response actually lived much longer. So you could actually kind of pinpoint who it was that was gonna live but based on their response. So if they had a good response, they had an 86% chance of survival. If they had a poor response, less than 50%, then they only had a 68% relapse-free survival. Um, so it, it would allow us post-operatively then to make changes in their treatment planning. Um, and one of the things we do when a patient has preoperative chemo is do an MRI first. And this is an example of a patient who had a big tumor before her chemo, would have had to have a mastectomy, and then had the chemotherapy and just had a teeny little dot left and was able to have a lumpectomy. And she's probably 12 years out now from that. So. We don't always give chemotherapy first. It's very important to remember for our postmenopausal, especially our older women who carry estrogen receptors on their cancer, that we can actually give them anti-estrogen therapy, the aromatase inhibitors like I mentioned, tamoxifen like I mentioned. We can give those drugs to patients before they go to surgery or even for a while in lieu of surgery if they have other medical problems. So if a woman is 80 years old and has uh, a bad heart valve and needs to get to the operating room to take care of that valve first before she can tolerate breast surgery, we can put her on an aromatase inhibitor for six months to a year, shrink that tumor down, stabilize it, and not have to worry that we have to rush to the operating room with the same survival as having gone to surgery first. So how we approach these patients, the, the water is a little bit muddied between the smaller tumors that we wanna treat with chemo first, and then the big tumors like inflammatory breast cancer where it's, it's, in, the, it's in the lymphatics of the skin. Th those are systemic problems that we always treat with chemotherapy first. So we consider anybody who has greater than a two centimeter tumor um, in a smaller breast or a bigger tumor than that, um, we consider them for neoadjuvant therapy. We, we give them the option to, okay, we can make it smaller first, we can treat it first if they want to. And then any patient who desires that, she gets a clip placed after her biopsy 
um, and then all of the tumors are followed on MRI because that's the best way to see them. And then after the treatment, we have the clip there and we know where to operate. If all the tumor has disappeared because of the treatment, all we have left is the clip and we know where we can operate. We also have at UCSD, and I have to give a, a, a real shout out to this, we have something called the iSpy trial. And the iSpy trial is a trial that was the brainchild of Laura Esserman up at UCSF. And what it does is it offers to very high risk women with a little bit larger tumor, greater than two and a half centimeter tumors, it offers them the chance to not only get standard chemotherapy first, but an 80% chance of getting some of the very new biologic agents that would otherwise only be reserved for very advanced stage four disease patients. The tumors are then followed serially on MRIs. We do serial biopsies and we are looking for a lot of different molecular markers in those tumors to see how they change in response to the drugs. And we are looking to see how the tumor changes in response to the drugs. The really interesting thing about this trial is it's, it's a collaboration of industry, Safeway Vons, um, the NIH, um, getting in and out drugs very quickly. So a patient may have a triple negative breast cancer and get an innovative PARP, to, PARP inhibitor. And we may find that that one doesn't work very well on 10 patients. That drug is then pulled and another one is replaced. So it's a very good way to assess drugs quickly for breast cancer management, something that's hard to do in the cancer world. So this is a very popular study right now. Um, 20 centers across the United States are on it. We're the only one in San Diego and people who are eager to get some of the new biologic agents and eager to find out more target inf targeted information about their cancer um, are coming to us for this. What are some of these biologics? So I mentioned uh, the PARP inhibitor. Basically, um, PARP is an enzyme which repairs DNA damage, usually in very immature cells. So it's expressed in, in the very young, basically. It is then usually a quiescent enzyme. It's usually not expressed anymore. For some reason, in certain cancers, like the triple negative cancers that don't have estrogen receptors, for the, in the cancers for the BRCA patients, for some reason that enzyme is re-expressed, allowing the cancer cell to repair itself. So we think that may be one mechanism why these cancers are a little resistant to chemotherapy. So the PARP inhibitors are a new class of drugs that help to inhibit this enzyme. And so we, we've been very excited over the last couple of years about this potential in the triple negative patients and in some of the other high risk patients. And this is one of the agents that is in the iSpy trial. If the patient does not get it in a clinical trial like iSpy, it is only then available to her once she's metastatic. So obviously we would rather see a patient get this before she's metastatic. And so that's why another good reason why something like a clinical trial where it's available um, is so advantageous to the patient. ER2 new. These are really now technical words. ER2 new is an oncogene on 30% of cancer cells. And we found out from a large clinical trial over a decade ago that if you took a monoclonal antibody against that oncogene called Herceptin, that the death rate from breast cancer drastically dropped in that patient population. It was, it was remarkable. The patients who were on the study that got the drug lived. The patients who were on the study that didn't get the, the drug, many of them died. The trouble with Herceptin is it doesn't go to the brain, it doesn't go into the spinal column. And so there are some additional drugs that are being worked on. Nerapnib is one of them, Lapapnib another. Again, very difficult names that are hard to pronounce, and I don't know why the biologics have to have such difficult names. But these are all being developed to target, again, this is, we're getting towards individualized care in breast cancer, targeting the breast cancer molecular marker whether or not be the estrogen receptor, whether it not be the ER2 new oncogene, or whether it be something else that we find down the line. So we're, we're changing the mix together with chemotherapy. All right, so that's kind of where we're going with the, with the, uh, tr the systemic treatment, biologics, targeted therapy, looking at the genetic profile of the tumor. What, are, what else are we doing surgically? we're trying to make the final outcome of surgery less and less. So you can see this, the patient's um, left breast kind of contorted and contracted due to her lumpectomy. Now we would approach the same cancer, a cancer on the outer part of her breast. We have radiology put the needles to localize the cancer. I draw my mastopexy or breast lift incisions around it and the woman has a breast lift removing the tumor and now her breasts are symmetrical. So that's called oncoplastic surgery which is a very popular term right now. 
We also will do little local things in a larger tumor. Tumors that are in the at the 12 o'clock position of the breast can be difficult because they can kind of cave in. We can do little local geometric flaps in order to close those. Um, and this is just showing how you see the kind of big hole that's being created. We lift up the tissue, we close it. Once that breast gets radiated, that, that little scar that's created there, you can barely see. And, and then you can also see there's not a divot. There would have otherwise been a big divot there. Um, and you can see that. We will design our lumpectomy in a way that will be camouflaged. So tumors that are right on the, on the nipple. Um, I do what's, what's called a periorealer incision with a little radial extension that kind of opens up the whole breast. I can then take out a sizable t a piece, which she needed, she had a large tumor, and then kind of cone the breast back together. And then later I can come back and do a little lift on the other side. So the, the whole key is to kind of get the breast back together in a cosmetic fashion and then worry later if I need to fix you know, the symmetry on the other side a little bit. Um, tumors, again, that are around the nipple, I can take out and then um, I can take a little extra piece of skin and purse string the whole thing back together, just like you're shrinking it in so that the, the whole breast volume gets a little smaller, but the whole shape of the breast stays the same. Tumors that involve the nipple used to tra tra traditionally mean a mastectomy. Now we can basically take the tumor out through a breast lift procedure, take the nipple with it, and then create a whole new nipple on the skin and the chest wall. So that little piece of skin that you see right here is actually her chest wall skin, not her areola. So I designed the, so I, I basically designed the mastopexy pretending that I was working off a little piece here that was really the nipple. The nipple goes in the trash, or not the trash, but pathology. Um, and then I later come back and build a nipple. This is called a neoareola, basically. Uh, we do need to be careful when we see lumpectomy defects that we don't overreact to them and maybe create more harm. Um, doing like sometimes people will try to do a breast reduction in the lumpectomy patient and that can, because of the history of radiation, that can lead to a hard fibrotic breast and then, and then require a flap. Um, so these are, you know, these are some of the examples here. This patient um, had a lumpectomy and radiation and then I'm not sure what was done here, but it was something locally in the radiated breast tissue that kind of made it worse. And so we actually had to come in here and, um, you know, do, some, do a local advancement flap from the side and, and, you know, basically get rid of the scar and the indentation that she had there. Um, and this is another example of a patient who had a smaller breast because of the radiation. And the decision was made to reduce both of them this breast did fine with the reduction because it's not been radiated. This breast did not because it just pulled and contracted more. And when she raised her arm, she pulled out and she had a lot of pain because of that. So we actually had to bring her back and do a very, uh, an elaborate flap from the back in order to, to recreate that defect and get rid of her pain. So it's important in the lumpectomy patient, sometimes it, it, this, is her, this is actually her pre-op after her breast reduction. But if, if I had seen her, I probably would have not reduced this breast and just reduced this one to match. Once a patient has actually had radiation, it's important that, they, that you're cautious with how much you do to them. Um, and this is an example of a patient who had um, an, an expander in place and it just was, or the implant was not working for her for whatever reason um, and we brought her back and did a flap. So you know, whatever the patient's needs are in reconstruction, you know, we're, we're there to address them. And now, if we, our biggest problem is for our larger breasted women that are undergoing nipple sparing mastectomies, what do we do with all that extra skin? Uh, because now we have too much skin. So now we're actually doing our uh, mastectomies through a, an entire breast re reduction scar, basically. So we're planning the whole breast reduction scar and then, but just doing a mastectomy instead of a breast reduction. And then that's elevating the nipple into place like we need it. So that's kind of oncoplastic surgery in a nutshell and um, everything you wanted to know about breast cancer in quickly in an hour. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions.